Hello friends, my name is JJ. So as I get older, I find myself more and more preoccupied with one particular thought. Am I being useful enough to others? Now this might just be because I'm a middle-aged man with no kids, but a desire to help younger people in particular is something I feel much more strongly than I used to, with that mission in turn flowing into this channel where more than half of my audience is at least a decade younger than me. I do believe that there is a crisis of knowledge among young people today. As I explained in this video, I think that our education system has over-prioritized teaching supposedly practical general skills about how to think and learn, and under-prioritized teaching the sort of fact-based knowledge that people need to function in a very competitive, communication-driven society where a lot of assumptions are constantly being made about what, quote-unquote, everybody knows. So a while ago, using the app NGL, I asked my viewers on Instagram to anonymously answer a simple question. What is an important thing that you feel our culture expects you to be very familiar with but you actually know very little about. And man, the hundreds of replies I got were really interesting. They offered a window into what has become a reoccurring theme of this channel as of late, which is the concept of cultural literacy. The theory that some people, places, events, objects, and ideas are so often referenced in the broad public culture that knowing about them is in some ways as essential as knowing how to read or write. And based on your NGL replies, it is clear to me that a lot of you guys have some rather deep worries and insecurities about some of your gaps in this sort of knowledge. Gaps we can hopefully help fill today. So, as my public service to you, today we are going to go through a list of the top 10 knowledge gaps of my audience, and I am going to attempt to give you a one minute summary of each thing. And hopefully after watching, you will feel just a little bit more confident in your ability to navigate the culture. Okay, so by far the number one most submitted topic, the thing that you guys felt the most self-conscious that you lacked basic knowledge about was Watergate. All right, so I think that most of us know that Watergate was the scandal that forced President Richard Nixon to resign in shame in oh. 1974, but what was it about? So Nixon was re-elected in 1972, and basically the gist of Watergate is that the president and his advisors had secretly conspired to do all sorts of shady things to win that election. The term that was often used was dirty tricks, and the dirty trick that got everyone's attention was when people associated with the Nixon campaign were caught attempting to break into and bug the headquarters of the Democratic Party, which in those days was located in a big office building slash hotel known as the Watergate. After reporters linked the burglars to the Nixon campaign, the Watergate scandal revolved around a famous question of what did the president know and when did he know it? Which is to say, to what degree had Nixon personally plotted the dirty tricks with his advisors, which was considered a very shocking and offensive thing for a president to do in those more innocent times. There were high profile trials and congressional investigations that sought to answer these questions. And throughout it all, the Nixon White House engaged in obstruction Construction tactics that were uncooperative, dishonest, and even illegal in their efforts to prevent the truth of Nixon's dirty tricks plotting from becoming public knowledge. By the time Nixon resigned under threat of impeachment, the other famous line was that it wasn't the crime, it was the cover-up. Which is to say, the gross way that Nixon abused his powers as president in order to save his own reputation is ultimately why Watergate doomed him. As I said, Watergate occurred at a time when Americans were less jaded about politicians than they are now, and Nixon in particular had long marketed himself as being very square and honorable. So the scandal is often presented as being half of a one-two punch that made Americans a more bitter and pessimistic people alongside the disaster in Vietnam, which was happening around the same time. Okay, so your second most requested topic comes from a similar era of American history, Woodstock. So Woodstock was a giant outdoor rock music festival held in the small town 
of Woodstock, New York for three days in 1969. It's probably the most famous music festival in history because in addition to just being really big and featuring many of the top rock stars of the time, it is seen as symbolizing a sort of peak moment in 1960s American culture. Like, there was never anything more stereotypically 60s than Woodstock in terms of the people and fashion and politics and attitudes and all the rest of it. The lineup of performers was a real who's who of 60s musicians, including The Grateful Dead, The Who, CCR, Janis Joplin, Jefferson Airplane, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, and Jimi Hendrix, among many others. It is worth noting that many of these musicians didn't live for much longer, giving Woodstock additional relevance for being the literal last time you could see all of these people in one place. One of my favorite ever pieces of writing is actually a short essay on what it was like to visit Woodstock by the commentator Heinrich Hertzberg entitled What Woodstock Was Really Like. It's just so wonderfully wry and evocative and does such a fantastic job capturing the whole vibe of the festival, if you ever wanted to know. Let me just share a short excerpt from it. The festival began on the New York State Thruway, where every other car was packed with happy, long-haired kids flashing peace signs. On the country roads leading to the site, the atmosphere was of a vast medieval gypsy pilgrimage. We kept driving, slowly, because of the traffic and because by now the running boards and bumpers of our VW were piled high with people catching a ride. We came over the crest of a hill and there, sloping down before us and to our right, was a huge natural amphitheater covered with the biggest crowd any of us had ever seen. We inched down practically to the stage, abandoned the car, made our way to a spot halfway up the hill, sat down and waited. Number three, Kafkaesque. So this is a term that alludes to the surrealist novels and short stories of Franz Kafka, who was a Czech writer in the early 20th century. His stories often involved hapless men trapped in bizarre and confusing situations. So when we say that something is Kafkaesque, we are usually alluding to the idea of something that is very frustrating in the most extreme sort of way, like a situation that is so confusing and weird it makes you start to question your own sanity. Because one of Kafka's most famous stories involves a man facing trial for a crime that won't be explained to him, Kafka-esque is a particularly popular adjective to describe encounters with horrible bureaucratic systems. Like someone might say, my attempt to get a building permit was a Kafka-esque ordeal. That said, the literary set tend to get offended when people use Kafka-esque to broadly. They're all like, no, it doesn't just mean any random weird thing. It has to mean something that's weird in this one very particular way. But I would say they have mostly lost that argument. And speaking of literature, next up we have 1984. 1984 was one of the most important works of 20th century literature. It is a short novel written by the British author George Orwell, who was famous for writing stories with very aggressively political themes. Orwell wrote 1984 in 1949, and it's supposed to depict the world of the near future in which all of the terrible political trends of Orwell's time have reached a kind of hideous climax. England in the world of 1984 is accordingly a kind of horrible communist type dictatorship ruled by a murderous dictator called Big Brother, who uses elaborate technology to spy on everyone all of the time to ensure everyone does exactly what he wants. Perhaps the most famous thing about the dictatorship in 1984, however, is the way that the government is preoccupied with controlling language as a means of thought control, which is an idea that Orwell, as a writer, was very obsessed with. So Big Brother is constantly banning words, or giving old words new definitions, or introducing new words to express ideas more in line with approved government thinking and so on. There is a plot to 1984, of course, and it centers around a character called Winston Smith, who is basically a normal guy living in this nightmare society. But overall, I would say like 99% of the reason why people still make so much reference to 1984 today is just because of how memorable the dictatorship that Orwell describes is. And speaking of dictators, next we have Napoleon. I was a little bit surprised how many of you admitted to knowing basically nothing about Napoleon, but 
On the other hand, maybe not. Napoleon is often treated as just a generic guy from history, and it can be easy to miss the specifics of why he mattered. So France had a bloody revolution in the late 18th century that destroyed the French monarchy. And in 1799, a military guy called Napoleon Bonaparte staged a coup against the new revolutionary government and made himself dictator of France. Napoleon had been a top commander of the French military during the revolutionary period and had grown respected for his leadership skills. Once in power, he helped stabilize and modernize the French government, even introducing things like the Napoleonic criminal code that is still being used today. But Napoleon was also a man obsessed with war and had visions of bringing the entire world under his rule. Thus, we got the era of the Napoleonic Wars in which much of Western Europe was conquered by France in some way. But then in 1812, Napoleon launched a notoriously disastrous invasion of Russia which destroyed the French army and set the stage for him to be defeated by a British-led military alliance of several anti-French countries in the famous Battle of Waterloo in 1815. He was overthrown as ruler of France and sent into exile on this godforsaken island. Though he failed to take over the world, Napoleon is still often thought of as being one of the most successful conquerors in human history, and the vast number of wars and battles that he fought have made him a figure of particular interest to military historians, but his over-the-top ambitions have also made him synonymous with a certain sort of delusional dictator mindset. And the fact that he was fairly short created this whole stereotype of the Napoleon complex, wherein short men are said to go way too far in trying to compensate. Next, and on a completely different track, we have the Office. I like this entry because I think it is a good example of the kind of quiet insecurity a lot of us have towards pop culture things that are very ubiquitous, but we might not personally know much about. I myself didn't know much about The Office until quite recently when I binged through all nine seasons during COVID. So The Office was a sitcom that ran from 2005 to 2013. The gimmick is that it is supposed to be a documentary about this very unimpressive branch of a paper selling company in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Because of this broad focus, the cast of characters is really quite large and includes over a dozen different employees. Though the main ones are the boss, Michael Scott, played by Steve Carell, one of the salesmen, Jim, played by John Krasinski, and Jim's rival salesman, Dwight, played by Rain Wilson. Michael Scott and Dwight in particular are very memorable characters. They're basically these really pompous and self-important idiots who are nevertheless deeply oblivious to just how obnoxious they are to everyone around them. A lot of the show's humor comes from the very excellent comedic performances of these two actors. Beyond that, the show is just very sharply written, and I would say it has a certain intimacy to it as well. So much of the series takes place in a rather cramped setting, so you cannot help but start to develop a kind of grudging love for all of these different weird characters and their various eccentricities as you are forced to spend more and more time with them. After a while, you almost start to feel like these people are your own co-workers. Number seven, the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds were, and are, a wealthy Jewish family in Europe who these days are probably best known for featuring in a lot of conspiracy theories, especially anti-Semitic ones. The founder of the modern clan was Mayor Rothschild, who along with his sons established successful banking firms across 18th century Europe. They were known for making financial loans to European kings and governments to help them pay for their various wars and things. And this is basically the root of the conspiracy theories that would later haunt the family. Because the Rothschilds ran a business that often profited from war, from quite early on, people put forward theories that the Rothschilds were actually responsible for the wars and for the various dramas of international politics more generally. And because the family was Jewish, this fed into anti-Semitic tropes about how Jews, with their sneaky control of money, were the shadowy force behind everything bad in the world. On this front, it is worth noting that the only reason why the Rothschilds family even got into banking in the first place is because it was one of the few respectable professions that was open to Jews in 18th century Europe. Anyway, the Rothschilds' real-world influence probably peaked in the 
19th century, when they were among the most famous rich people on planet Earth. But over the course of the 20th century, the world of international finance became a lot more competitive and the Rothschilds struggled to keep up. A Rothschilds investment firm still exists, but is today a vastly smaller player in global finance and the family has been steadily shifting its focus to philanthropy for quite a while now. The fact that there are still all of these conspiracy theories about the Rothschilds has always struck me as incredibly anachronistic. It's kind of like how there are still conspiracy theories about the Rockefellers, another family that reached peak relevance over a century ago, but a certain sort of person remains stubbornly obsessed with just because they function so well as their preferred villains. Number eight, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa was a Catholic nun in the late 20th century who tended to very poor children in India, and during the 1980s and 90s was regarded as possibly the world's greatest living human. I am not exaggerating. When I was young and Mother Teresa's fame was at its peak, it was common to hear people use her name as a synonym for a kind of perfect, sinless person. People would say things like, give me a break, I'm not friggin' Mother Teresa over here. Pope Francis made her a formal saint in 2016. Her goodness was basically just embodied by the fact that she had devoted her life to working with the poorest of the poor, comforting and feeding and taking care of orphaned Indian children who literally had nothing else in their lives and might have also been diseased or disabled or disfigured and so on. Because she was this tiny, frail, and frankly ugly old woman, there was also this sense that she represented how true beauty came from within and how we should all aspire to live more selfless, less superficial lives. Because she was a Catholic nun, she was also a pretty hardcore Christian, and I think that this fact is what has made her sort of fall out of fashion in recent decades. Like, her views on abortion and birth control aren't the most mainstream. There was also a lot more skepticism these days about the style of charity she was associated with. You know, whether hanging out with a kindly nun all day is really the best way to address child poverty. Number nine, the Dalai Lama. Speaking of saints, the Dalai Lama was a very similar sort of character to Mother Teresa in the sense that during the 80s and 90s, he was widely seen as one of the greatest living people in the world. He is quite old now, so he is not quite the public figure he used to be but I am sure that when he dies, it will be a big deal. Anyway, Dalai Lama is the title given to the ruler of Tibet, which is a heavily Buddhist place that used to be an independent country, but was annexed by China in 1950. The current Dalai Lama, who took office as a child based on Tibet's odd pseudo-monarchical political system, was driven into exile after the Chinese conquest and as an adult, he spent a lot of time touring the world, advocating for a free Tibet and preaching his particular flavor of Tibetan Buddhism. During the 80s and 90s, the slogan of free Tibet was a popular cry for critics of the Chinese government, particularly those on the sort of hippie new age left, which is a cultural faction that doesn't really exist as much these days. At a time when China seemed to be becoming a much more capitalistic, militaristic, urban society, the Dalai Lama was easy to sentimentalize as a symbol of a kind of gentle, pre-modern Asian innocence. When I was young, I remember it was quite common to see a certain sort of person have like a wisdom of the Dalai Lama desk calendar or something like that. And he was hugely in demand as an inspirational speaker. But like I said, he is pretty old now. And I feel like the plight of Tibet has kind of gotten overshadowed by various other controversies associated with the Chinese government. So he's become a somewhat quaint and forgotten figure as the years pass. And the 10th most requested thing that you guys felt the need to learn about is the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was was a term used to describe a broad protest movement against dictators that swept across the Middle East in 2011. At the time, there was a lot of optimism that this movement might herald the beginning of democracy in that part of the world, and the fact that it didn't is now often held up as an example 
of the sort of naivete that many international observers sometimes have when it comes to revolutions in foreign lands. So the Arab Spring is usually said to have started in Tunisia, where street protests forced out the dictatorial government of that country in early 2011. Then, a few weeks later, there was a much more high-profile protest movement in Egypt, that forced the resignation of their more famous dictator, Hansi Mubarak. And then, for the remainder of 2011, all sorts of discrete political events across the Middle East started to be reported on under this Arab Spring framework, including the resignation of the president of Yemen, the overthrow of Colonel Gaddafi in Libya, and uprisings against the dictatorship of Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Basically, all of these stories had unhappy endings. Egypt briefly embraced democracy, but then had a coup and military rule was re-established. Yemen and Syria spiraled into civil wars that are still ongoing. And Libya is basically a failed state. Only Tunisia, the first domino to fall, is arguably clearly better off now than it was in 2011, though the future of their fragile democracy remains very much an open question. In the West, I think that the big legacy of all of this has been a sort of solidifying cynicism regarding the fate of the Arab world. The years following 9-11 are often remembered as being quite warlike and paranoid, but there was always an undercurrent of hope that the Middle East was on the brink of finally getting sorted out. The failure of the Arab Spring represents a symbolic bookend to that kind of thinking, a time in which many people concluded that no, war and dictatorship is just how things are gonna be forever over there. All right, and on that cheery note, we have hopefully filled your top 10 most requested knowledge gaps. Let me know if you would like to do another one of these surveys sometime. And if you have some other gimmicky ideas for how I can help you guys learn some other important things, let me know as well. And if you have made it this far and are not yet a subscriber, please don't forget to do that too. This channel has a great community and I would love for you to be a part of it as we continue to grow and learn and do exciting things together. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next week.